there's no general accepted definition of cybersecurity. I mean, everybody talks about cybersecurity, but you cannot go into the dictionary and say, well, this is exactly what cybersecurity is. It, it, it's a different thing for different people. And, and well, once you accept that, you can start making sense about all the different things people are saying about cyber and cybersecurity, that there's actually just, yeah, a free for all. You're free to do whatever you like, tell whatever you like about it. Well, the, the, the big hype now is the large language models. I sometimes half jokingly call them the plausible sentence generator because <laughs> it's, it sounds plausible what it's uh, saying, but the, the model does not have a concept of truth. Uh, it just says, hey, this is what other people have said. This, this sounds nice. And of course it does. Everyone, it's David Bommel coming to you from Cisco Live here with Vada. Really apologize for not getting the name perfect, but really want to welcome you. Thanks for having me. You have been doing cyber and IT for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, doing this, well, IT for 25 years, started out on Internet Help Desk and dedicated security for the last uh, 15 uh, years. Hopefully, in this interview, you'll be able to take you know all that experience and try and help someone who's perhaps starting or someone who's new to this. I'll just give the tips of ways that, you know, if I was starting, how I could do it better. And I see you got a book on the table. Can you tell us about the book? I did, yeah. I did bring this uh, this book, uh, Cybersecurity Myths and Mis Misconceptions. It's a <laughs> difficult title there. I think this is a great book talking about the things that many people uh, assume are true about security. Um, there's 160 myths in there and they explain why the myth is a myth and what is the correct way to think about it. So it's not going to tell you any technical stuff, but just the way you think about things. Uh, one of the things, for example, which was a bit of a shock to me, uh, actually, it says, hey, there's no general accepted definition of cybersecurity. I mean, everybody talks about cybersecurity, but you cannot go into the dictionary and say, well, this is exactly what cybersecurity is. It, it, it's a different thing for different people. And, and well, once you accept that you can start making sense about all the different things people are saying about cyber and cybersecurity, that there's actually just, yeah, a free for all. You're free to do whatever you like, tell whatever you like about it. So first tip, read the book and be sure not to make the mistakes that a lot of people before you have made by assuming things, thinking, hey, this is the way it is, but actually challenge yourself saying, hey, this is what everybody thinks, this is what everybody assumes, but is it actually true? And well, there are scientists, there are professors uh, there, so they will have footnotes, they will have explanation about the logical fallacies, and it's a very thoroughly researched uh, book, and I can recommend it a lot. So any other sort of favorites that you've, you've found in the book? Well, there's the, uh, it's a very old one. I'm sure you've uh, mentioned it before. It's about that obscurity is not security. Yep. So if it's something is unknown or not published, it means that it has to be secure because nobody knows about it. Well, there's obvious reasons why that is not uh not true, but there's also other ones about vulnerability management. The fact that a patch or update is available does not mean that the issue is solved. It just means there is, on the one side, you've got a problem and there's a solution, but there's still a distance to cover between actually applying the solution uh, there as well. So there's many times when there's a, uh, a critical update and people go, ah, luckily there is a fix available. Then the work starts, yeah. So yeah, that's that's one of the things I uh, I mentioned. I must confess, I'm about halfway to three quarters through the book, so there might be still more uh, more in there, uh, more gems to uh, to uncover. But what's interesting, you've got all this experience, but that book's still really valuable. Yeah, yeah, because even I find myself, um, yeah, also having these assumptions, and this is the first time somebody actually wrote these things down, a and then you realize actually, hey. I do the same. Sometimes you have this, this magical thinking, say, well, this new shiny thing will solve all our problems, uh, be it uh, blockchain, be it the metaverse, be it the next shiny thing. There's always this, this hype with things and it's, it feels good to, to, to join in the hype, say, well, I really would like this to be true. But yeah, magical thinking, wishing something was true, unfortunately, doesn't make it, uh, doesn't make it so. And once you're realizing, hey, I have these great expectations from the solution, but let's do a reality check. What actually can it deliver for me? And is it right for uh, for me? Because, well, as an example, you've got these great 3D glasses from, from Apple. They're, they're wonderful, but they're at a price point where it's not something you say, hey, I have 10,000 employees. Let's get everyone these magic glasses and go for it. I mean, that's not not viable. How No matter how cool it is, 
it does not make sense to give everybody such an expensive piece of equipment. Uh, Would AI fit into that or do you have other thoughts about AI? Is it a um, shiny new thing? Absolutely, it is the shiny new thing, but it also has, yeah, I think there is, again, like with most other things, there is a, a nugget of wealth in there around which it, it's forming this, this big pearl uh, of other things uh, around it. And if we look at everything that is being promised with AI, if there's 5 to 10%, which is actually true, I would be a very happy man uh, if that happens, because there's now a lot of expectations that nobody will have to work anymore and those kind of things. And they're like, well, maybe I would love to believe that uh, myself, but probably it's going to be something, yeah, something in between um, there. But we do need good tools. And, well, the, the, the big hype now is the large language models. I sometimes half-jokingly call them the plausible sentence generator because <laughs> it's, it sounds plausible what it's uh, saying, but the, the model does not have a concept of truth. Uh, it just says, hey, this is what other people have said. This, this sounds nice, and of course it does. On a technical side, it's not enough that it sounds nice. It actually has to be accurate and true, especially on the security uh, side. Um, but there's other uses of AI. I mean, this is one also one of the big things. Uh, everybody calls everything AI. Even a simple assistant is now yeah. uh, AI. One of the things I do like, uh, also being called AI, is basically is the natural language uh, interpreter. So I ask a question in a conversational tone, and then there is this piece of software which can understand and translate my request into a technical uh, request. So, hey, which user groups have access to this server? And then it knows how to look up the user group and actually get me the firewall rules or the policies matching that, uh, that request. And that's going to be very useful to speed up investigation. You don't have to learn the exact syntax on how to check the Active Directory identity system for the members of the group and see how that's mapped to your policy and your firewall and everything. If an AI can do that for you and just tell you, hey, these finance people have access to these six applications, that's a huge uh, time save. So the AI assistant for firewall sounds promising, right? And some of the other AI stuff that Cisco are developing. Yeah. Uh, as a time saver, not as a human replacer, but as a powerful tool to help you uh, get insights, investigate faster. Yeah. So I'm glad you said that because a lot of people have the concern that AI is going to replace them, but you just see it as like an assistant rather than a replacer for a human. Yeah, because we still need the humans to decide, hey, what do I want to do, uh, etc. And it is just, well, making it same uh, compared to the internet. I mean, we're still doing the same things as we do before. We have interest we find people who share the interest we we search for things we want to know more about i mean it's not like the internet has um, made people um, unemployed or anything uh, but it does help you to do things faster and quicker uh, i tell this my kids all the time back when i was young long time ago <laughs> if you saw something interesting or you thought hey i would like to know more about this event well, maybe you had an encyclopedia you could look into. If you didn't have an encyclopedia, you'd actually have to wait until the next working day to go to the local library, hope they did have it, uh, have it covered. And if it's a very specific um, subject, you might have to go to the big city and go to the big library, and maybe they would have a book. And now, within two seconds, I can look it up and find it. So it's helping me to do things quicker, but it's not replacing my curiosity. It just makes it easier. If I'm curious about something and I want to see a great video about it, read an article about it, uh, find about history or actually talk with people with experience on that subject, I can easily do it with the media computer in my pocket. That's very true. Now, we spoke offline about all the different vendors. So can you, for everyone who's watching, like explain the issue in Cyber Today with number of vendors and you know what's your advice about that yeah the, um, the big challenge there uh, it was also mentioned in the keynote here on uh, on tuesday there's an astonishing number of vendors trying to sell their solutions their products there's by the last count i heard three and a half thousand companies trying to convince you that their solution is the one you need if you just well publish on LinkedIn, hey, I'm head of purchasing for this company, they will swarm you uh, and trying to get you to spend money on their, uh, their products. If you don't have a plan, if you don't know, hey, this is what I need, these are the capabilities I need, it's very easy to get, well, seduced by the great, great marketing and you spending your cyber budget improving in an area which you already have some great protection um, 
Take email security. If you already have great email security, yeah, you could add a product which does QR code uh, scanning and, and natural language detection uh, stuff. But if you don't have proper authentication for remote access, that is the area you would want to invest in. So my advice there, um, have a look at the available frameworks. There's the Center for Internet Security has a great one. It's a free resource. Uh, NIST has some information as well. And they just say, hey, look at your organization size, what kind of threats you're facing. I mean, if you're in finance, you have different threats. And if you're a corner shop, for example, but everyone connected to the internet has to do something, have a look at those advices and just make a checklist and saying, hey, how am I doing? Am I doing things in this area? And when you have your shopping list saying, hey, I'm missing some controls on DNS security. Hey, I'm missing some controls on uh, user on and off boarding, which is a very unsexy subject, uh, but it's very important because, uh, well, identity was mentioned as well. Many intrusions happen with the accounts which are already in place. It's much harder to get into the organization by a vulnerability or trying to brute force your way uh, in when there's actually accounts which have all the access you need to get in. You just need to, well, impersonate the right user. You need to find their password, convince them to okay just once on an MFA message, those kind of things. And then you have already pre-authorized access to a lot of systems within the organization. So build your plan, make your shopping list, and then go looking at which vendor can help me with these uh, solutions. One other thing, um, not just a framework, you don't have to do it all yourself. Find your peers as well. Yeah. You might be the only one or you might be a small team within a large organization, but every single organization will have somebody with the same issues. Best thing you can find is basically yourself one year later. So he already made all the choices uh, for this year. You can say, hey, what have you done about that? Hey, how have you done, uh, done this? So finding your peers is very, uh, very important as well. They will, be, they will be honest on their feedback. They will have experiences they can share with you, which are invaluable uh, for you. So where, did you, where do you find those peers? LinkedIn or any suggestions? It's very difficult on LinkedIn because you might find somebody with a similar title, but they might not have the same responsibilities. There's actually, uh, well, we're here in the Cisco Insider uh, booth. There is a, a Cisco program. It's called the Advocacy Program. Anyone can join, it's a global program, and there we also have the different collaboration channels, security channels, you can find your peers, so you can ask the questions, uh, hey, I'm faced with this challenge, how, do, how, is, uh, how have you solved it? Uh, who knows something about uh, this and this uh, challenge? And that's a great way because they're the people, yeah, like I said, yourself, one year in the future, they have made these choices. You can always find somebody in a similar situation offering advice or even if they haven't had the same uh, situation, at least, hey, pay attention to this. Hey, uh, this is something you should uh, look at. You mentioned Cisco Insiders and you're part of a special group. I'm part of Cisco Champions. So perhaps you can talk more about that just and how do people join that? Because you found it really valuable, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. I Actually, the program itself, the Insider Advocate, started in 2017, Cisco Live Berlin. Uh, I joined on day two. So I'm oh, not wow. a day one joiner, but a day two, uh, day two joiner there. The format is very nice. It's not just a forum or a chat group. They actually work with a challenge system. So somebody uh, posts a challenge usually from Cisco saying, hey, we're looking for people with experience on this subject of, hey, we have a new announcement to make. There will be announcements in different areas. There will be challenges. And if you complete a challenge, it can be you leave a review or you post about something or you, uh, you share your experience. You'll actually get points, which you can then use again to buy. Well, you can buy books, but there's also uh, tech uh, gadgets and stuff to, to buy. There's even challenges, which let you win a ticket to Cisco Live uh, as well. So it, it's, it is gamified, but it's, it's, it's a serious game. It's not just like, make a fun video, uh, but it's about, hey, leave a review, help your peers uh, connect with, uh, with people. So that's a nice way. And well, you've been to Cisco Live as well. There's so much going on here. The nice thing I always say, hey, with the insider advocates uh, and with the app, you have Cisco Live in your pockets. You, you open it every morning and there will be new things you never knew about. You can, whenever you have 10 minutes, have a look and interact uh, there. But like you said, it's it's a networking, right? Not networking as in Cisco networking, it's networking as in people networking. People networking, yeah, absolutely. You can learn so much from one another. Even in just like talking to you, I've learned a lot. It's amazing how much you can learn just in person. Yeah, and especially the, well, the, the experiences. There's, uh, I've had dinners all week. I've been sitting at a table with 
random people don't know their organizations, don't know their roles, but once we start talking technology, we connect with each other, we understand the challenges, and, well, we can learn from each other. Hey, how did you do this? Oh, you're already using this platform. What is your experience? I'm trying to make the same move. What should I look at? And that's invaluable. There, There's no, yeah, that's irreplaceable. There's no websites or anything yeah. which can replace that. And we were talking at one of the, the, the get-togethers, so we were actually at like a, a drinks night, which was great. And you were telling me that you, in your organization, you don't just work for one company, right? So can you tell us about the companies that you support and what you do there and sort of the lessons that you've learned and advice again? Yeah, well, I'm actually, uh, I'm Security Architects and we're a managed service security provider or MSSP for short, which means that we deploy and manage the security solutions for the organizations. I know it sounds weird, but nobody starts an organization with the idea, hey, I really want to worry about the security of my networking, the security of my users. I want to really get to know identity management and firewall ruling and, ooh, snort ruling. Yes, that's <laughs> why I started this this consultancy firm, no, they just want to sell their product, provide their service. Well, you know, of course, security, it, it's a big business. There is a real need for being um, secure. So what we do, we say, hey, you want to run your, your business? We can help you make it secure. We can 24-7 monitor the solutions for you, uh, work with the updates. We know what's possible with the solution. We talk with the customer, hey, what are your needs? What are the changes with your organization? and make sure that the security solution we provide actually uh, matches with the needs of the organization. If you do set and forget security, you configure it and you just leave it running. Within weeks, you'll have gaps. There will be people working around your solution. You will have devices not having the uh, solution deployed, con uh, new uh, internet connections going around your, uh, your great filtering services, etc. So you need to stay on top of what's happening within the organization to actually offer good security for the organization. So you work with a whole range of customers, I take it. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do everything from, from national government, uh, multinationals, uh, local companies. Um, it's about, um, I'd say, 200 seats till, well, tens of thousands of, uh, of seats because they all have to say, well, they connect to the same internet. They have the same bad guys trying to get into their, uh, their networks. And even the smaller companies, they need to have the same kind of protection. They need to have 24-7 monitoring. They need to have people understanding the threat landscape, the, 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 the bad actors out there. From all that experience, working with all these customers, are there any like nuggets of information or like special things that you can share to the audience? Don't tag security on later. It's not built now secure later. It's, uh, well, it's a theme here as well. It's called secure networking. When you start connecting things, do it in a secure way. Because if you try and add it on later, it will have gaps. I mean, we tried that on a huge scale with the internets. We actually made a network saying, hey, we want to connect everybody and everybody is equal and we'll be leaving everyone. If you send me an email saying, I'm the Prince of Denmark, Outlook will tell you, hey, the Prince of Denmark mailed you. <laughs> um, and then we try to, to add some security features onto that. Uh, sender protection framework, uh, DKIM, DMARC. And the, the thing is with these uh, security solutions, a lot of times the bad guys are actually better at implementing than the normal organizations. I get great spam messages with all the boxes checked, doing the SPF, the DKIM, using a trusted sender framework. And then I get a message from my account team. I get a message from my support staff or something or an external organization, and they don't have these features uh, implemented. So if you try to add it on later, it will not work. It has to be in there from the, uh, from the beginning. So you mentioned SPF there, you mentioned DMARC, a few things like that. Any best practices that you think companies can implement for quick wins? I, I know it's a terrible question, but like things that you've generally seen that the common mistakes people make. Don't be satisfied if it just works. Just working is the bare, well, it's not even a bare minimum. It, it's the, yeah, that's step one. Hey, I can send you an email, but we're not putting this system into production until we've actually secured it. Say, hey, I can send you an email, but I want you to be able to make sure that it is an email from me that the content, the account number in there uh, and everything is actually the same one as I put in there. And if you're not happy with the email you're receiving from me, I want to give you a way to let me know. And within the original email specification, those were all not even mentioned, not no. even possible. It's no. just plain text and hey, the message arrived. Woo, -hoo, let's go home for the day. Yeah. And now 2024 uh, even puts 
the level higher from what is acceptable. 1980s, we could just say, hey, I can send you a message. It works. 2024, there's more things I need to do. And that's on anything. Moving data somewhere, hey, you can access the data. That's great. Multi-factor authentication, encryption. Have a plan for if you no longer want to use the service. What actually happens with my data then? Those kind of things. So just, yeah, security top of mind uh, uh, there. It has to be there from the beginning. Do you find that organizations, I mean, like you said in earlier, they're not thinking about security because they want to perhaps sell a product, but do they push back against you when you try and like implement good practices or security practices? If you just say, hey, I'm going to hold your product launch because I'm not happy yet and you don't explain it, yeah, they will say, well, you're the annoying guy. Next time, we're not going to even tell you we're launching a product. Yes. But if you're able, and that's a challenge for us technical people, if you're able to explain it in a business sense. Hey, if you launch this now and in three weeks, you'll be in the headlines, uh, product failed, uh, hacked, uh, whatever. Is that what you want? Or are you, you're going to give me those five days to actually secure it and then have a successful launch? If you tell, hey, this is what happens if we don't do this. And then there's not say that your security team will be unhappy, but tell them, hey, you'll be in the news in this way. This is what your customers will experience. Then they start thinking, hey, Unhappy customers, losing money, don't want that. Reputation damage, those kind of things. Yeah, that's what you need to talk about. So don't just say, hey, you're not complying with this RFC or you're not complying with this technical document that you're actually the only one within the company who ever read the document. No, translate it to dollars, euros, uh, customer experience, and then people start to think, hey, those are the things I care about well as well. You've been on this journey for 25 years. <laughs> I'm starting today. Well, I wish I was, but let's say I'm, Pretend, in the shoes yeah. of, yeah, I'm in the shoes of someone starting or you're talking to your younger self. Any advice to, you know, get to the position you're in or like how to get started in cyber? Um, never stop being curious. Uh, a lot about security, about cyber is trying to understand how things work and why they work the way they do. I assume you're familiar with BGP. Yes, you know the history of the uh, of the protocol, how it was designed? But why don't you just explain it for everyone? Yeah, uh, it's actually known as the, uh, I think it's called the three napkin protocol because it was worked out during a lunch break on the back of three napkins. They just wrote down, it was Cisco and IBM people, they sat together, they just wrote down, hey, wouldn't it be cool if it would work like this? And it worked like that. And now I think it's uh, it was 89. So now we're uh, over 30 years later and it's still the backbone of the internet. It's still the way it works. If you see a protocol uh, like BGB, Border Gateway Protocol, learn a little about, hey, how did we get it? How old is this stand? What is actually in there? Um, SNMP is another one, right? It's another one. Uh, SMTP, all dodgy protocols. Yeah, yeah, all you probably noticed that uh, anything invented in the 80s, uh, early 90s, they still had a bit of um, trust. Yeah, trust. I always say, well, those were the hippie people who actually started working at that time, uh, determining uh, protocols. And you can also see that a lot of the networking stuff was actually coming from the universities uh, there. And there's a big yeah, academic trust uh, going on there. Not too many troublemakers within the, uh, within the universities. And they were just said, hey, great, we can do these uh, things and we don't have to worry about the big bad world out there. But that's not, not the case anymore. So, so be curious. Be curious. Anything else? Like, is there anything that you need to study? Do you need to get a degree? Or is it just like get experience and then... I'm actually old enough that when I started, there were no security education. You just had IT and some programming and, well, security was optional. Yeah. Um, look, well, so I took the long way around. Uh, like you mentioned, 25 years uh, from internet help desk, consultancy, uh, on-site engineering, uh, all those things. So, I, yeah, I took the long way around. Nowadays, you can take shortcuts that are actually pretty good. Uh, cyber ops trainings, there's actually uh, some great resources, YouTube instructors as well. You have uh, Cisco U. So there is a lot of resources to help get you started uh, there. But do hands-on stuff as well. Um, get a lab, get a virtual one and try actually putting things into practice because there's no replacement for hands-on experience. So your daughter's here. She's 16. She is, yeah. And what's your advice to someone that young? Because you, you, I'm assuming you'd love her to get in, into this world. I would, yeah. I mean, she's been, well, exposed to tech since the day she was uh, she was born. I was just looking at my phone. I even have a picture. She's two years old. 
and I'm working on a PC and she brings in her uh, her Duplo bricks saying, hey, can I help you build this? Well, I love it. And, and that's the way, because if you start with tech when they're, uh, yeah, when they're 12, when they're 15, they will have been, yeah, they will not have the exposure. So advice, um, well, it, it, it's basically the, the same. Get the hands-on experience. There's some very great um, sites like uh, Hack the Box, for example. They have free courses. They will have also explanations about things. And don't be afraid to do experiments to, to find things like, hey, I have no idea what this is. Let's watch a video. Let's get to know this, uh, this thing. If you can find a community of, of people who have the experience, there's some great community events as, uh, as well. Uh, also around the bigger tech uh, events, there's usually some, uh, I think in the US they're called the B-Sides uh, events where you can get in and, and connect with uh, people. You don't have to pay the, the big ticket price to get to the main event, but you can just go to a bar, talk with the technical people, uh, people there. They, yeah, they can tell you about it. Well, there are resources available. Uh, see what works for you. I mean, not everybody uh, likes to to study. Uh, some people like to get hands-on experience. And even if it's just at, 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 a, at a support level, uh, a lot of people started out at support. But remain curious. Keep asking questions. And within no time, you'll be looking at promotions and other uh, things, ways opening up for, uh, for you. But uh, again, apologies for my pronunciation. Is there any way that people can perhaps connect to you on LinkedIn or other places? Yeah, of course I'm on uh, I'm on LinkedIn, and well, I moved away from the Twitter platform like many uh, tech people. I'm on Mastodon. It takes a bit more work to get there, but we're a very friendly community. And one of the nice things I like about that platform, it's non-commercial, so nobody is mining your your behavior or details. It's just like being in a pub talking to people without anyone overhearing, taking notes of your yeah. interest in things. So LinkedIn, Methadon, there you can find me by my uh, my name. I'll put those links below. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate the support and Thanks for sharing me. your knowledge with everyone and experience. Thank you. Thank you.